the Zodiac Thor. That's what we call the Zodiac that we take to remote locations and that we ferry people with. So after many years of maritime exploration, everything from lighthouses to shipwrecks to remote islands, I had a pretty good idea of what I was looking for in a watercraft. And since most of the exploring had been done on the Great Lakes, and we'll probably still do a lot of exploring in the Great Lakes, we needed a boat that could survive a heavy sea state, everything from chop to dense wave frequency. We wanted something stable at high speed or that would uh, be stable when idling in three foot chop. We wanted something easy to trailer, easy to launch, that was reasonably lightweight. Something that could take on lots of water, um, had really good fuel efficiency, could maneuver in shallow water from shoals to rivers, um, could land on beaches, carry a one ton useful load, was kind of a requirement, and was survivable in most conditions. And most important, we wanted something versatile with excess power um, and fuel efficiency. So an inflatable boat seemed to fulfill most of these needs. One of the most versatile, lightweight models in this category is the Zodiac Futura Mark III, dubbed the Master of the Seas, for good reason. It measures just less than 15 foot and weighs in at about 270 pounds, but it carries nine passengers or a payload of 2,800 pounds. It's made of PVC, which is rugged, versatile, and easy to repair. It has eight airtight chambers to maintain buoyancy even when punctured. And I've actually experienced this very damage while at sea, and this multi-chamber concept works great and was a lifesaver. It performs very well in heavy seas and is stable in all sea states. It's very lightweight, but carries a very big payload for its size. And it's also a very versatile platform, allowing for many different configurations. For about $7,000 new, it's superior and cheaper than most options, but it's a cramped environment for sure. And the power plant is the Yamaha F60, a four-stroke 60-horse outboard. It provides excess propulsion, and it's great with fuel efficiency, much more efficient than a two-stroke. It's very quiet and very reliable. It's about 60 pounds lighter than its competitors, but it's still hefty at 250 pounds. So you put these two together, and it's the 520-pound foundation that we use to create our very capable adventure boat. So now we're going to talk about all the additions that we've added. So Zodiac Thor sits on a really cheap trailer. Um, hopefully someday we're going to upgrade that. So it's on a pretty cheap trailer. It's got a uh, transom saver so that uh, this these attachments don't get much stress on this chamber. We got a 60 horsepower Yamaha four-stroke engine. I used to have a 14-foot Quicksilver um, um, inflatable boat that uh, did not uh, that had a two-cycle didn't have a four-stroke and I got about one to two miles to the gallon um, now I know normally in watercraft and maritime tradition you do engine fuel consumption by the hour but that's not very helpful when you're looking to go a hundred miles and you need to know how many gallons to take so um, far superior motor very heavy we got some seats and we got a console for the uh, Zodiac with quite a few modifications. Aluminum floor, you can have a wooden floor too, um, or I think uh, these come with an inflatable floor at 16 foot, um, but aluminum seems to be the lightest weight, best option. We have two tanks that we keep with the boat at all times, giving us about 13.2 uh, gallons of fuel. And then we have regular old deep cycle marine battery with um, a couple of alligator clips attached to a power point, a power supply um, that we can use. On the old console here, we have the standard issue iPad holder uh, OtterBox um, case that uh, snaps in to the situation. So that we can use uh, applications like iNav, which help us um, with charts and things. Got the standard issue tachometer with a few other readouts. We've installed a power supply to keep the iPad going and maybe to charge some phones with a separate switch that allows us to cut off power to that. We got a standard issue compass, probably one of the, one of the weakest pieces of instrumentation that we have. The compass is your most reliable and primary um, instrument on the boat, but uh, we got a cheap one. Um, we also carry a handheld compass and you can see that the steering wheel blocks the view of it so we don't use it quite as often as we should but on the open water that becomes actually 
quite important to use. You can see underneath, got your spotlight, your tanning spray. You can see another power supply right here um, for plugging things in, usually to charge that spotlight if we're using it a lot. Got your standard issue air horn ready at the helm so that we can signal other boats, which we do use that when we get into busy shipping lanes. As we walk around the boat, we'll see the tower with a couple GoPro camera clamps on it. And then we have the, the beam navigation light <clears throat> holder. We don't keep the navigation light in there all the time. We actually keep that stored in our box and then we put it there when we need it. They're battery operated LEDs. They run on AA batteries, give us quite a few hours of power. We don't spend a lot of time navigating at night. We've got this excellent tower by Marine Atlantic. Provides us a little elevation um, for things like the antenna can also hang the old mountain bike on there so you can take that off to an island that might have some trails so on and so forth other side boat store boats not documented with the coast guards just registered with the state of michigan got your standard issue kill switch and all the things that you normally expect from a from a standard issue boat we got the marine radio not something you see on 16 foot boats very often but when you go to the open water that's important all the wiring comes together goes back to the battery including the antenna to the antenna hooning and mooning every viking has the uh the two ravens on their boat those are odin's ravens long story there's a, actually a story on the website about that we got the inreach the inreach is a satellite tracking device that allows us to do a couple things to call for help if we need it um, although not as reliable as maybe a plb or an epurb but it does allow us to call for help if we need from a private organization, but also it allows us to be tracked and to communicate as another means of communication in addition to the marine radio and other means that we might have. This is a homemade lanyard wrapped around the seat and made out of standard issue one inch webbing with 4,500 pound capacity and your standard issue carabiner that goes on the back of the life jacket when you're soloing it all uh, through the open water. It's important that you don't fall out of the thing and separate from your boat, especially when the engine's running. Although the kill switch will turn it off, this keeps you attached to the boat so it doesn't drift away in the wind, so on and so forth. Got your type B1 fire extinguisher for flammable liquids and petroleum-based fires. Again, just standard issue Coast Guard equipment. And then here we have the headlamp, some charging cords for either um, sometimes an iPad, sometimes a... Uh, um, a regular old droid phone got the headlamp we got the battery wrench there we got the spare key and a spare kill switch that thing breaks or falls off it pulls it out of here and if you want to go anywhere you got to pull this thing out and that gets a little annoying after a while so it's nice to have a spare one or if you're with other people and the driver falls out and gets separated from the boat then it's nice to have an extra one so you can go pick them up without trying to hold that um, engine won't start if that's out, won't run, blah, blah, blah. We open up the orange box. We actually have a checklist so that we can check all the items that we need to check on the boat. Um, things that should be checked often, things that probably shouldn't be checked, just to make sure that we have everything that we need is laminated. We got the shaker, um, shaker tube, um, shaker siphon tube that is probably the best invention since the wheel. Um, probably not, but close enough. Got our spare air horn, got our nav lights, got a patch kit for the Zodiac. We got another patch kit for the Zodiac. We have the screwdriver, um, which is kind of a universal. We can stick whatever we need in there. Battery jump pack, um, great jump pack. As long as you don't get it wet and soaked, but this jump pack will jump start uh, the Zodiac's engine or provide us power if we need it, um, which is kind of nice. Got your standard issue trash bags, got a lot of uses, got a little insect repellent in there, so on and so forth. We only have one battery in the uh, in Thor. Um, the last one that we had, and I forget the name of the last boat, last boat we had, we actually had two marine batteries. So we kind of had like house batteries and starting batteries, just like you might find on a sailboat. Um, it's a lot of weight. I'm, uh, I'm not sure that we needed it at the time. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that we still need it, but uh, we do. The, uh, this Zodiac has some pretty cool, cool uh, one-way scuppers that uh, basically drain the boat, eliminating the need of a bilge pump. 
which is kind of cool. As we move up to the front, we got a Yeti cooler that we don't use for coolers. What we needed here was a strong seat that would support the weight. We used to have one of these boxes up here, but those collapsed if somebody sat here. So this is uh, an extra seat and at the same time provides waterproof storage in the Zodiac that includes things like our emergency flares, a light that clips on to the tower so that we can use it on deck at night. Um, we got the standard issue key, foul weather gear, got a map case, we got an emergency blanket for hypothermia, we got our binoculars, another patch kit, it's kind of a theme there. We got the rules of the road and the operator's manual um, and a variety of other things and tools that we need while underway, kind of exceeding the recommendations from the Coast Guard on what you keep in the boat. So keep all that in a Yeti cooler. See another five gallon tank. And we got throw bags on the other side. So throw bags are kind of useful. We got your standard type four um, PFDs, throwable types, um, so that we can throw them to somebody if they need them. Got your boat hook. Standard issue kind of boat hook that you might find on a sailboat that lets us hook things and um, maybe find a mooring. I don't know why we do that or pull things in from the water. Um, push us away from docks and things. This boat's very easy to handle. And here we got the bow bag. And the bow bag's got a variety of items from the pump that we might need to add air, which we can do underway because all of the valves are on the inside of the boat. We also got fenders back there for docking, marina stuff, marina work. And then we also have a ladder for re-entry into the boat. First aid kit, um, spare paddles, um, we have a shelter. The shelter, we basically take the boat hook and we stand it up here. And then we extend that up and then we run a line from the tower to here to there. And then we hang a regular old tarp from the top, creating a tent on the boat, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, we got uh, some, some water. I think we got three liters of water in the boat for emergency purposes. And so that's the bow bag, got our PFDs. Um, the nav light for the front actually hooks onto this apparatus so that we can use it at night. And just your standard issue trailer with spare tire that I'm not sure I can get off. Um, so that's basically the configuration of the Zodiac Thor. And it's the Zodiac that we use often out in the open water. Um, we'll probably be doing more sailing with larger boats. But that is the vessel that we use to do long distance travel on an open boat. Now one of the weaknesses with this boat is the fact that we only have a single propulsion, propulsion device. Be nice to have two, but you can see on the transom there's not a lot of room for that, and the boat itself there's not a lot of room for that. So if that propulsion system fails, we don't have a backup propulsion system unless you put a fan up top or something. But we don't have a backup propulsion system. So when you do your planning, your risk assessment and planning with this boat, you really have to take that into account and figure out some uh, emergency action plans if you do lose propulsion when you're 60 miles offshore and you're drifting further away you have to have the ability to contact more than the coast guard somebody to come get you somebody to tell you so on and so forth so that's something you have to keep in mind because we only got one propulsion system i don't like that um, i haven't figured out a way around that at this point but uh, it is what it is so we'll, we can probably figure out a sailing rig uh, maybe a main mainsail or a, some kind of jib device to get us somewhere if we needed to using the tarp and that's probably the next step with what we got. And then finally, we have the towing accessory, the thing that we have just to tow Thor around. And, uh, you know, we paid a little too much for something that just tows a boat around, but it is what it is. We probably could tow this thing around and it's gross weight of between four and 500 pounds. We can probably tow this thing around with a Ford Festiva, but we don't. So now we got people yelling, um, people complaining about their ankles. So I'm gonna let you go, but that's, Thor. The Zodiac Thor. Alright, talk to you later.